Greetings, humans and cinephiles, and welcome to The Last Video Store, a bastion of the world of film, cinema, and movies, where we have a mythical place amongst us. We're in it right now, where every single film ever made is on the shelf, and you can rent it to watch it and enjoy it. My name is Alexis Holiopoulos. Yes, and I pronounced that exactly right. Alexi Toliopoulos. Toliopoulos is how I would say it. And it's how you have to say it as well. You can't screw up my surname. But I'm the host of this show and I'm the clerk of The Last Video Store, the titular program. And joining me every week, I've got interesting people talking about some of their favorite movies. And on the podcast, on the show this week, is my hero, my personal mentor, my filmmaking idol. It is documentarian Anna Bronowski. Anna is instrumental to who I am as a storyteller. She was my mentor, my guider, my consulting producer with my collaborator Cameron James on our documentary series Finding Drago, its sequel Finding Desperado, and its threequel Finding Jesus. Anna's always been an inspiration to me and such a big backer. She was in fact the first person I ever told about that story when I first started cooking it up because uh, she was my instructor and lecturer and tutor at film school. And I was already a humongous fan of her work because the film Forbidden Lies, which is her expose, her investigative documentary on a hoax author, it was just one of those documentaries that struck me at a really personal, like prominent time in my life, a prominent age. When I was a teenager, I saw it in the cinemas with my dear old mum, And I knew that I was like, I one day I want to tell stories like this. I want to make, if I, maybe I'll find the right story to tell a documentary with. And it just always stuck with me. It's just that, that primary text for the stuff that I wanted to make. And ever since then, she's been a personal friend, a hero, a champion, and someone that I just respect almost more than anybody else on earth. So it is my honor, my pleasure to have her in the last video store to go through her best new release pick, her two weeklies. And then I have the difficult choice of finding a unique, bespoke, personalized recommendation for her based on her taste and everything I know about her. Anna has also just written a memoir uh, called That's an Angel. That's an Angel. It's like a road trip. She describes it as a freaking feminist Mad Max drugs and violence fueled memoir full of darkly funny stories. She's such a wicked brain. So I think uh, I'm very excited to see her trying new forms and new mediums to express her true stories and combining them with narrative and stuff. So yeah, pre-order this, order it. Uh, this is a personal copy for me that she has signed. So it's an honor, but let's get into it. Let's talk to Anna. Let's talk film. Let's talk cinema. Let's discuss movies. Here we go. the collection it's a beautiful it's awesome. collection i really want to watch that one and that one <laughs> yeah i think that one is yeah that's a good movie over there it's yeah a great one. i just like the color of the cover of course it's a yeah. beautiful color beautiful i mean they're cover. a bit generic but that one really caught they my are eye generic that is definitely <laughs> the ones we have on display directly around us they are of the generic nature yeah and don't go opening the boxes because all you'll find is a freaking empty space yeah 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 <laughs> but what is contained inside each box is a dream a dream I love it. of entering the world of film. And not only that, it's a video DVD dream, isn't it? Absolutely, video with, DVD dream. With 80s undertones. There are some 80s undertones around here. There's yeah. some mysticism the as decor. well. The decor. Oh, a bit of 90s new age. A little bit of 90s new age. Yeah. I would say we've got everything covered. Every vibe, every aroma is also in this video <laughs> store. <laughs> We've collected all the aromas as well. I haven't been in a video store like this since 1989. Wow. Okay. Mm, yeah, wow. Wow. Yeah. So we're going to be unlocking some memories for you today, I'm yeah, sure. If I still have them. They do say <laughs> that if you can remember the 80s, you weren't there. Wow. But, you know, 
Yeah, but you still have the memories of film. That's I do. all it is. Some. Let's take a go back to them. Let's try. We've got one of your films out on loan currently. Right. This is a late copy, a copy of Forbidden Lies, one of my favorite movies, one of my greatest influences. It's currently on loan to another member of the video store, Cameron James. <laughs> I lent this film to him probably six or seven years ago. Yeah, right. When we first started working with you. Yeah. And he's never returned it to <laughs> me. I've never, I've, I've always tried to find it. I don't know where it is anymore. Right. But Forbidden Lies, your documentary film about hoax author Norma Curry. Yep. If I was on the other side of this desk right now, if mm. I was in your seat and I was interviewing myself, it would probably be in my batch of weeklies. It's one of the films that means the most to me and probably one of my greatest influences. As you already know, we made a series that definitely is in the lineage along from that. It's like the, what would you say, progeny? Mm -hmm. I'm one of your children. You're yes, my you mentor. Yes, you are. You're one of my hoax children. <laughs> one of your hoax Not children. only that, you share a last name with Norma's alleged ties to the Greek mafia mm -hmm. ex-husband, John Toliopoulos. Yes. So <laughs> when you first rang me to say you wanted to work with me on something you like, Forbidden Lies, mm -hmm. I almost didn't take the call, especially when you said you were Toliopoulos, because I've always lived <laughs> in fear mm, that they're going to come back to you yeah yeah and i still don't know to this day alexei like, i'm playing a very long game am i am i not <laughs> connected to the greek mob in chicago who knows it's yeah. why i've kept you close yeah you keep your enemies close yeah and your friends closer yeah yeah of course is that how that, that, of, is that how course, of course you're my friend you instilled in me something that is so core to my approach to factual storytelling, which is so apparent in Forbidden Lies, because in that film, you are working with this hoax author who wrote this book called Forbidden Love mm. about, uh, what's the term? It's a- An, an honor killing an of honor her best friend, and yeah. she passed it off as the truth, mm -hmm. and it was sold, I think, in 15 different languages and countries for- Worldwide bestseller. Uh, yeah, six-figure advances, mm -hmm. unheard of for a first-time author, mm. uh, just before the in, the illegal invasion of Iraq, when um, potboiler memoirs about evil Arabs mm -hmm. and their oppressed women were doing gangbusters in the West. Yeah. And there's still, I mean, Forbidden Lies is full of it, but one of the one of the big unanswered questions, the conspiracies that's part of that film is, who was Norma really working with? Mm. You know, to to be out there peddling this basically fake book. Yeah, and you're like an expert on hoax authors and like hoaxers. The thing that you instilled in me that I found so interesting and so part of how I approach things now is the idea of believing your subject as much as you can. Believe mm. them until you don't believe them. Yeah, yeah. What? Uh, why is that your approach? Why do you think that is the way to tell factual stories like this in that manner? I don't think I had a choice with Norma. I mean, she was such a brilliant uh, improviser. Mm. You know, she's someone who's a confabulist. Mm. Um, she lives life, finds life at a, a normal level very boring. Um, she's high-level Mensa. And for her, spinning stories was as natural as breathing. And she got bored if she wasn't. Mm -hmm. So it was a cat and mouse game. And, uh, you know, within 12 hours of interviewing her, she conned me too. She was that good. Yeah. So I can't sit here and say, yeah, Alexei, I'm an expert on hoax mm -hmm. authors. Um, she was so good, she conned me too. And I think that was why the journey kind of works mm. because it's only as my, my kind of delusions about her start to peel away that I realise that this is a kind of catch me if you can with women mm -hmm. and I'm bumbling Tom Hanks and <laughs> she's Leonardo DiCaprio with mm -hmm. her mercurial charm and always 10 steps ahead of me. Why did I embrace everything she said? Well, at the beginning, yes, I believed her. After a while, I didn't. Mm. But it's just great material. Mm. Um, films about people who lie are fascinating. Look at Dangerous Liaisons. Mm -hmm. Look at Talented Mr. Ripley. There's something really exciting for an audience to look straight into the eyeballs of an actor and not know if they're lying or telling the truth. And I use the, act, the word actor on purpose. Mm -hmm. Norma is an actor. She yeah. is a performer. She's constantly telling a yarn. And the joy for the viewer and indeed, you know, the filmmaker and the on the other side of the lens is, hang on, 
is she for real here? Is she not? Why can't I tell? It's kind of like watching a magician. Yeah. Like pull off this fantastic illusion. You know you're being conned, mm -hmm. but the fascination and the spectacle comes yeah. from how did they just do that? Um, the other thing is I think real life is no different from fiction in a way. We all act, we're all putting on masks. Mm -hmm. You know, here I am in your lovely 80s video store <laughs> with my 80s video, I've been here before mask mm -hmm. on, but we're all in a green screen studio. Sorry, spoiler. <laughs> no, no, no. no, 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 it's <laughs> real. Stay up. Yeah. Um, but do you know what I mean? It's so, about that artifice, right? Yeah, and the camera doesn't lie. Mm. And I think there's, there's, there's a reason Dangerous Liaisons, one of the greatest films about dissemblers ever, yes. was mostly shot in close up, mm. even though they spent spent gazillions on the wide shots and the sets and um, the producers were really pissed off when the filmmaker and the editor ended up just going for the close-ups mm -hmm. because it's being inside John Malkovich's face yeah. while he's lying or Glenn Close or the it's young... It's that close reading that you can only the, get. The young Uma Thurman. Mm -hmm. It's electric. Yeah. So for me, Norma's story... It, it had to be doco because if you'd made it up, people would have said, I don't believe this mm -hmm. script. Yeah. And yet, paradoxically, it made it a fantastic con movie in the same style as all the other con movies I've ever studied to mm -hmm. make the film. The yeah. Sting, Ocean's Eleven, you name it, all of them. F for fake. Yeah. I mean, I watched every great heist movie I could find and then all I had to do was kind of plug and play mm -hmm. Norma's various conspiracies and lies into that structure mm. because she was working on the same thing, the yeah. con. And she's just such a fascinating subject. Yeah. But I would say I love the way you talk about it because... I mean, for me, when I think about communicating to audiences, mm. I, I always put it this way that genre is a language that mm. audiences are completely fluent in, yet they're unaware of that, un like how fluent they are in it. Yeah. So I think the way that documentary filmmakers and factual filmmakers can use genre mm. as a way to just to slowly or to really quickly communicate to an audience to understand something on a deeper level mm. and or to find that resonance there. I think it's the thing that has probably drawn me to factual storytelling the most. Interesting, but also, you know, you also love, you're a cineast, you love fiction, right? Mm -hmm. And funnily enough, this is the right time in the history of cinema to be drawn to factual because we're mm. now in a post-truth age. Absolutely. The 21st century is no longer about doco box over here, mm -hmm. fiction over here. Everything is blending. I it's mean, all the hybridity now, Look right? at AI, look at text to video. Everything mm -hmm. is up for grabs. There is no such thing anymore as evidentiary videos. The truth, anything can be faked. Mm -hmm. So Forbidden Lies also, the meta narrative of that is believe no one, especially if they're saying they're giving you a documentary. But I think there's a big caveat here. Mm -hmm. You're talking about audience. Audiences are familiar with this language. They understand. Like mm. everyone's got a camera. Everyone's a filmmaker now. Citizen filmmakers, Ziga yeah. Vertov predicted them in 1929. Oh, wow. yeah. And now here they are. He was right. Okay. So my feeling is I feel I'm obliged to any person watching my films, especially for Binalize, any doco, mm -hmm. is that if I'm going to use illusion and trickery and artifice and basically f with them, mm -hmm. I need to let them in on the con at some point, yeah. on the mach machinations of the illusion. And Forbidden Lies was one of the film first films to do that, to be honest. Yes. Um, and I was inspired, in other words, reveal the paraphernalia just sitting out of frame that mm. enabled you to green screen Norma or to... The metatextuality. Yeah, of all, zoom yeah. through the porthole. And mm. now everyone's doing it. You look yeah. anywhere, everyone's doing it. Even you know that it's an old idea when Channel 7's doing it, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, or, or the 7.30 report on yeah. the ABC. Ooh, let's, let's, you know, get them to stare down the barrel and then show the camera, mm -hmm. you know, in the wide shot. Oh, my God. Mm -hmm. But back then it was very new yeah. and kind of radical and the one film that inspired me to do that was American Splendor. Oh my gosh. Which is an course. awesome film. Fantastic Paul and, Giamatti performance and, based on the graphic and novel exactly, series. Exactly, and has him narrating mm -hmm. the real words of As the actual graphic novelist. Pika. Yes. Henry Pika? Ha 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 Harvey? Harvey Pika, yeah. Pika, and, and has real per people mm. and actors, yeah. right? And I was so inspired by that film. Mm. I just thought. I'm making a film about a con artist who lies as often as she breathes, pretty mm -hmm. much, um, who deals <laughs> with what she nature. calls faction, mm -hmm. which was a term that wasn't very familiar back mm. then, 
that gives me carte blanche ethically and creatively as a filmmaker mm-hmm. to also con the audience but That's, let them in on it yeah. because what I really want to do, and this goes back to my training as an actor, I never mm-hmm. went to film school, is I want the audience to feel what it was like to be one of Norma's victims mm. or to feel what it's like to be in that white studio with her as she just, oh, Anna, you're so full of shit. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I did this because of this. Yeah. And and to me, it's visceral, right? Yeah. So what's more truthful? Interviewing Norma with a couple of photographs from her life behind her in a talking head mm-hmm. or actually taking you inside what it is to yeah. be conned by Norma. What's more truthful? What's more authentic? And of course, like what is a better way to present a subject than using like the style yeah. or the way that the subject presents themselves? That's well. right. That's right. So I'm, a, I'm sure you are too, but I'm a big believer that every film finds its form. Mm-hmm. Idea first then how you're going to tell it. Yeah. Well, speaking of that, it's actually perfect lead way into this because <laughs> about the idea of storytelling and fact and fiction, you're approaching a new medium for storytelling mm-hmm. right now. You've just written your, your not your first book, but your first memoir, That's an Angel, uh, which is like a recollection of almost like your first days of adulthood, right? Yeah, I was really dumb. But yeah, it's a coming of age story. <laughs> yeah. Um, here, thank you. Thank you for that really overt hey, and generous plug on course. a show about <laughs> which this has nothing to do with, actually, except it's a cute cover. It's a great cover. Um, but, you know, it's your style. It's cinematic style. Yeah, inherently. yeah. It's called Dats an Angel and mm. it's a coming of age story. It's got a lot of people who are now famous in it. So I've mm. hidden a lot of names. Yeah. And in fact, I often thought of Norma while I was writing it going, oh, wow. oh, am I doing the right thing? Is this truthful? Is it not? But basically everything in the story happened. And what were my film touch points? Mm-hmm. Um, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Of course, because it's like a road story that you've got here. Uh, it is. A it's road a road trip. movie. It's a yeah. road movie. Basically, I was a privileged little twat who didn't know anything doing arts yeah. law at Sydney, mm-hmm. auditioned for NIDA, didn't get in. They told me to get life experience. So I went hitchhiking to Darwin, got kidnapped by truckies. <laughs> Bang. Um, <laughs> That's yeah. a hell of a pitch. Yeah, yeah. But it's not a victim memoir. Mm. It's kind of like um, Tracks meets, uh, what's the Las Vegas film? Hunter S. Thompson. Hunter S. Thompson. Fear and Loathing in Las Fear Vegas. Lo- yeah, but with more acid yeah, because it's wow. set in the 80s. It's even, a, more even more acid. More <laughs> acid. It's a f- feminist Mad Max on really bad 80s speed. Oh, like, that's a movie right there. <laughs> that is a movie. And we met some great characters, Alexa. Yeah. yeah. What was it like to like kind of change your form and like going to the written word as being like the final presentation of a story? Was it like a difficult kind of like bring the facts to it or you no was it, was, it? it was finally quite easy because I actually kept a diary so wow. to you and your video store subscribers mm-hmm. please always keep a diary you yes. never know when it might come in handy so I literally don't know how I did this because I was often very stoned while I was <laughs> hitching but I just wrote everything down yeah. and so I transcribed it that way um, I also retraced the the road trip in 2018. I did exactly the same thing, met all the same mm-hmm. crazy characters. <laughs> They're all um, still out there? Well, uh, some of them have uh, uh, ancestors now. <laughs> um, but, yeah, no, some were still out there. Um, I guess for me uh, – it's kind of like re- writing a screenplay. Mm. I write visually. Yes. So I want to put the reader there. So I use a lot of visual language. Yeah, okay. Um, and look, to be honest, you know how hard filmmaking it is. Mm. It's kind of, there's something very nice about just sitting there and being your own boss on your keyboard. So you felt freedom? I felt freedom. Wow, like never before. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, no investors, just a very nice publisher who kind of liked the idea. Yeah, so, great. Yeah. Well, I can't wait to read it. That's yeah, an angel. that's your copy. Have it. All right, that's my copy. Maybe wow. one day someone will make a DVD of it and you can put wow. it here. We'll put it on the shelves. You know? We're yeah. gonna, I'm going to pop it into the But computer. I only want it finished on DVD. <laughs> that's it. We want the first DV <laughs> yeah. movie straight yeah. to DVD. We're going to film straight. it directly to a DVD. Yeah, a book to DVD. Oh, wow. Gorgeous. Yeah. Yeah, Gorgeous. Yeah. Maybe yeah, like that's, low rent. Like the DVD's first... the new vinyl, man. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> Maybe I'm gonna say this. Put this out there because I know this is an area of fascination to you. What if we just copy and paste the whole book and put it into one of those AI text to video? Perfect. In fact, let's it do goes. it. Let's do it. Let's and it'll give be the it. first good AI movie. Or bad. Let's <laughs> give it to Sora. If we yeah. give it to Sora <laughs> or Gemini, Google, or even Runway, right? Yes. And we just literally type it all in <laughs> um, and let it come out all rubbery and yeah. weird. That will actually sum up the state of mind I was often in. <laughs> That's the AI are the only people that can perfectly recreate the feeling of being on acid. Or fear and loathing did mm-hmm. the same thing. Absolutely. But they, it cost a lot more for them. They didn't have AI. Exactly. We'll have it done in an afternoon. Yeah, we could. Well, I'm going to send you out to the shelves. Okay. One new release for you. Yep. Two weeklies. Yes. And then I'm going to bestow upon you an absolute rarity. Oh, can't wait. It'll be a stuff pick recommendation okay. based on everything I know about you, your picks, your taste, everything. Okay. Your auras, your vibes, and yes, your aromas will go into, <laughs> into my choice. The so, aroma. <laughs> so am I getting a smell vision film? Oh, every movie I, I did actually have a shower, you know. Oh, okay. I yeah. did know. I yeah, did yeah, know. Yeah, I yeah, detected. Yeah. I was like, someone showered not too, <laughs> not too long ago. But every one of our discs, we do have a scratch and sniff card purposely made <laughs> that comes in the DVD cover as well. That's gorgeous. Of course, it's like analog haptic, isn't it? Mm -hmm. That's it. That's what we're hoping to conjure up. Okay, cool. So come on back when you're ready. New release. Ah, oh, Alexei, thank you so much for that walk through your amazing <laughs> store. Um, and My I know exactly what I want. I mean, oh, of course. I, I really do. So the new release. You've got a beautiful stack of films. We'll start with that new release. The new release is Poor Things. Art House. So from last year. From Yorgos Lanthimos. Absolutely. One of my favourite filmmakers ever and one of my favourite – I would probably say it's one of my favourite films from him. Yeah. Before we kick into the discussion, can I ask you, Mm. this is a film that I'm finding hard to categorise. What genre do you think I place it in on the shelves here? Oh, that's such a good question. Um, Is art house a thing anymore? We do have an art house section. You do? We do have an art house section. Should we hit it in the art house section? Coming of age art house? I was thinking my choices were either art house, science fiction. No. Okay, fantasy? No. Adventure? I think art house it is then. Well, you could. Or comedy? Dark, very dark. Mm. I mean, you could in theory call it period drama, but that's just uh, no, very. No, no. no, thank you. I mean, you. why I love it is it's it's the the absolute opposite of what you'd expect of a period drama. That's absolutely right. Which like, is why I love it. And it's that kind of like meshing of tones and feelings and that styles. So, Oof. so you know, here he is trying to make. And by the way. My favourite period in history, if anyone said to me, you know, someone up there mm-hmm. said, hey, you can live in someone some other... Someone Lord Jesus? Uh, no, 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 the great she goddess, you know, <laughs> said, yeah. hey, you can live wherever you want. Like, I know this time in, mm-hmm. in the human <laughs> evolution is shit. So where would you rather live? <laughs> yeah. I would say the Belle Epoque, the fin de siècle. So the late 1800s, mm-hmm. probably... Portugal or France wow. or maybe in England that right and that's exactly the period in which he set poor things. Now why I love it though is unlike those merchant ivory films mm-hmm. where they'd spend thousands on just the right horse and on just accuracy. the right embro- – he's lent in to the idea that it is a period film and guess what? We're not even going to hide it. So mm. instead, he hires a, a, an artist to replicate dioramas as the backgrounds – big, huge painted sets for these various places that she goes. And it reminds me of Gilliam. Mm-hmm. Uh, it it reminds me of Fellini. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it reminds me of the spectacle and astonishment and beauty and wonder of the artifice of filmmaking. Oh. So so yes. this is why I love this film. Mm-hmm. Um, not We're getting only... gooey in love with this film right now. Oh, totally. I and I'm, don't agree. even get me started on the narrative. I'm just mm-hmm. talking about the style. Mm-hmm. The other thing is, of course, I loved what he did with The Favourite, where he, mm-hmm. he up-rezzed or, or, or upgraded the, 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 the period film there by mm-hmm. shooting it on, on new kind of fisheye lenses with minimal lights, That's right? That's kind of it. Like even the way that... The, the lenses they choose for this movie are fascinating. Like it's Brilliant. endlessly entertaining in just kind of every, like the sense of pure cinema, the mm. way that the story is told, the techniques of cinema in there. And I think it is also like with the idea of references because I think 
The other stylist that you didn't mention that I think is so key for me with this film is James Whale. Oh, yeah. Um, who is Frankenstein, yeah, the right. bride of Frankenstein. Yep. Those are two of my very favourite films. Yep. And this obviously it owes so much to Frankenstein. Yes. But it's also like the playfulness, like there's a slight, just a little slight kitschness that he brings into this. And there's that camp quality in like the humour of it all. But the thing that I find astonishing beyond all of this beautiful artifice, the surrealism of the film, yeah. is these really unique performances. And he's Yorgos is someone that's always been able to like, elicit unique performances from people. But I think Emma Stone is absolutely astonishing in this film. Yeah, she's brilliant. I think he's also referencing late 1800s camera mm-hmm. technology. Yes, of course. Um, so the zoetrope, you know, all that stuff that yeah. people were doing and the weird kind of lenses and the flickering. Even that, that Ziga Vertov, exactly. like that man of the movie camera kind of feeling. Yeah, but even pre an actual cinema camera mm, you know there were yeah. all those other things that people the played with they, they, all those yeah. I, I honestly feel he's playing with that a lot of the time as well yeah um emma stone is extraordinary and she had a very major role in it didn't she wasn't she one of the producers as yes. well they're like strong collaborators yeah. those two and now. i'm not at all surprised yes. because so the style is one thing and yes i love lathamos there's mm-hmm. no question Lobster, take or leave, but I, I really loved um, the uh, – what was it? The, the one, favorite? That, that. Loved it. Yeah. But I love this one even more. And now I want to talk narrative. Um, mm-hmm. it, it, it's a film of its time in that it is a coming-of-age story about a young woman – but not one you would expect mm. because what he's chosen to do, as you know, is make her a character that is is raised outside the socialisation normally given to young girls. Mm-hmm. She's raised as a highly clinical, pragmatic person who is trained to look for empirical evidence. Mm. So put that in a fecund, sexual, young woman's body who's, who's just discovering her sexuality yeah. for the first time. And it just raises such interesting post-Me Too questions Mm -hmm. about femininity, masculinity, the battle of the sexes, whatever, um, gender Mm. in the 21st century because she's asking all the sorts of questions that any rational person might ask of this very unequal and bizarre situation in which women were put, you know. And I love how the men keep falling in love with her because they're just confounded. She doesn't do any of the things that women are socialised to do. And it's so funny. Yeah. I've never seen sex scenes that make me laugh out loud mm-hmm. and not are not remotely erotic, by yeah. the way. No, no, no. No, they're just funny. And the language, the way it's written, and let's give a shout-out to McNamara, yeah. Australian. Absolutely genius screenwriter. Brilliant writing. Mm. And, you know, I, I am, I'm a big believer, obviously, in, in telling stories that haven't been told and storytellers who haven't maybe been given a mainstream, lens in which to tell them. Having said that, I think McNamara has absolutely nailed in a brilliant way um, a female experience. Mm. And how the hell did he do that? Well, it's testament to him as a writer. Mm -hmm. I mean, Anthony Minghella did it in the 90s. He used to write, he was one of the few directors writing brilliant female characters. How did he do it? He removed himself from gender and socialisation and just put himself in their shoes, Mm. right? So, Hats off, actually, and I'm sure Emma Stone had a lot to do with it too. Yeah, I mean, she's so good at embodying the character. She's brilliant. And the film finding shape around her and that performance. Yeah, yeah. But it's also like just that great collaboration. Like, I would say this, I'm absolutely enamoured by that Mark Ruffalo performance. Yeah. Because the way that he plays this caddish character, like this real, like, I don't even. You have to make up words like boofus. He's like a real boofus in this film. Well, he's film. a pants man, you know, <laughs> a legendary uh, pants man. Uh, he's a total Lothario. Absolutely, and I think there's just like and she totally breaks him. If you she? if you could you could watch that performance just slightly separated, the context just slightly separated a little bit, or just on a different day, and you're just like, this is one of the most horrendous performances in a film. But in the way that's placed in the film, the way it's cared about, the way it's thoughtfully collaborated yeah, with yeah, yeah. between writer, director, actor, and the rest of the ensemble, there's something about this performance I think is absolutely hysterical. It's one of my absolute favourite performances in the last like decade. It's heightened. He's almost like a caricature. Absolutely. I mean, 
I, I think, to be honest, I feel slightly differently about his performance in that he never nailed the accent. Mm-hmm. His accent is dreadful. <laughs> to me, that's the absolute part of the charm. Yeah, that's well, the charm and, for and you know, me. such was the charm and the mm-hmm. power and the persuasion of the filmmaking that I ended up embracing that yeah. anyway. Um, but yeah, you could see Ruffalo, the actor, as some American actors do, just struggling so hard yeah. to do the clipped vowels of an English <laughs> actor and just failing. And yeah. some of his best moments in the film is when he's really there mm-hmm. and he's really angry or heartbroken and the accent goes. Yep. And you're just going, I believe you there. Yeah, I it's mean, the that's embracement great. of those yeah, failings yeah. as well. Yeah. That's like the fun and the charm of yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's such a great film. And it, to me, it makes perfect sense because I know another movie that you love mm. uh, as a pick for you, yeah. another film you love is Orlando. Yeah, I love so Orlando. Tilda Swinton. Yeah. And I never really made that connection like between, you know, the shared DNA of these two films until you mentioned Massively shared. this film. And I was like, oh my gosh, Orlando, of course. Yeah. Because I know you love both those movies. So gender play, mm-hmm. um, another coming of age story, but set over two different centuries, mm-hmm. a very radical kind of subversive take on modern politics and sexual politics but set historically yeah a whimsical highly stylized approach to filming i mean sally potter's eye for yeah. symmetrical frames and i'm a big kubrick fan mm-hmm. and the symmetry i cannot get enough of but also uh, young tilda do yeah. yourself a favor i mean she had it in that film absolutely and, and also the shots of uh there's one shot in particular like i think it's the first time you see Billy Zane from her perspective. Yeah. And I think if there's ever a need to just go, well, I hear the term female gaze used a lot in film. Yep. What is that? That's the shot you watch to go, oh, I understand intellectually and emotionally Which what that term means. Which was the shot means. exactly? It's like him on a horse. Oh, like yeah. him or she's fallen from a horse or something. It's oh, yeah. I've and seen he's it. got the big mostly thighs. Yeah. And there's just something about the way the camera captures him and it's like, oh, wow. Yeah. I'll give you another one. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't remember, maybe because I watched Orlando when, when I was so young, I wasn't even sexually very, <laughs> you know, yeah. responsive. Who knows? Um, but the first time I had that real sense of a female, straight yep. female gaze objectifying a man as a sexual object or an object of beauty from behind the lens was Harvey Keitel in the piano. Oh my gosh. When she does this One of the slow great buttocks on cinema ever. track across and it's the first time I went yeah. was shot by a straight woman. Yeah. Even gay men, I haven't seen direct films mm-hmm. like that, although Almodovar also yes. does this lovely objectify- God, objectification of men. We've got to get Almodovar to lensing up on Harvey Keitel's naked ass one day. Oh, and my it God. Change well, the probably world. not now. No, um, I think we get one more. We've got one more chance. One more, yeah, got- maybe body double. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, come on. But, yeah, it was that that female lens mm. thing, sexual. Yeah. But anyway, we're off track. What were we talking about? Orlando. Oh, yeah. yeah. The other reason I love Orlando is it has, uh, someone who I always regarded as a kind of mentor or an angel, although I didn't know him very well, but I always loved him. And that was Quentin Crisp, yeah. who was uh, the inspiration for The Naked Civil Servant, mm-hmm. that film that starred John Hurt, yeah. who is a very brave, for one, a, a trans person mm-hmm. really, way back before we even had the word trans, yeah. who who had the courage, even though he was delicate and and not very strong physically, to dress in a feminine way, to dye his hair, to wear cravats and makeup, and to walk around high camp in in Britain and get beaten up. Yeah. And became a a kind of a role model, really, for the burgeoning gay Mm. and lesbian culture that was now, you know, coming out in the 90s. He became like this maiden aunt of courage. And so when I was making my second film ever, which is called Sexing the Label, which is about underground queer, gay, lesbian, uh, transgender is Mm. what we called it then, cultures in Sydney, I went to New York to interview Quentin because I just thought, I need your stamp of approval on this film. I need to talk to you about this. And I'd just seen him in Orlando the year before. And I just couldn't get enough of him. He lived downtown New York in a really seedy area and he liked to go to this place called the Mars Bar. 
he was maybe 89 at that mm. point and very frail and it was a snowstorm. He said, meet me at the Mars bar at one in the morning. And so I did. And it was uh, the sort of place where freaks, junkies, mm. you know. Ne- like cowboy vibes, ne- if you will. But, and dangerous, yeah. right? The minute he walked in, everyone stood up. Wow. People gave him a seat. Wow. There was this halo of light around him. And I'll never forget walking out with him through the New York snow arm in arm and him saying, I took it as a sign from you know who that when I outlived my agent, my time was not far away. (laughs) And a year after I interviewed him, sure enough, he travelled back to England, Mm -hmm. which he had avoided for 30 years, to die. Wow. So he's an amazing man. Yeah. And watch Orlando just for him playing Queen Elizabeth. Queen Elizabeth. It's it's remarkable, right? It's so gender. And I love it. He's such an it's such an interesting presence as well. Yeah. And just thoughtful casting. Yeah. I Not think Not only that, he really knew film, yeah. Alexei. Mm-hmm. He used to talk to me for hours wow. about Bette Davis and yeah. all the divas I saw him of the forties. Recently as a talking head in yeah. the documentary yeah. as well. I can't remember maybe it was Celluloid Closet. Yeah, or something. yeah, he's definitely just, in that. Oh, it's so cool. He really knew his wow. stuff. Wow, yeah. wow, wow. Your mentor, you're my mentor, <laughs> therefore he's my mentor okay. as well. Okay, yeah, yeah, cool. <laughs> Let's go on to your first weekly pick. Now, oh, yeah. Anna. Yeah. Weekly. This is a movie that you introduced me to. Okay. And I would say you maybe are one of the foremost experts in this realm of cinema right, right. now. Right, okay. This is a film from North Korea. Yes. This is the North Korean rendition or inspired by a version of a kaiju film. It is their version of Godzilla. It, it is. is called Pulgasari. Yes. <laughs> Adventure. And I would say this is probably in our adventure section. Because uh-huh. it's that kind of fantasy Monster epic. movie. Monster movie. And I think that this is... I had such a delightful time watching this movie on your recommendation. It made me want to delve deeper into North Korean cinema. Yeah. When I say you're one of the experts, you are... You are one of the. Are you still one of the only people to ever make a film in North Korea with North Korean crews. I'm the only filmmaker from the West to get complete access to the North Korean film industry and interview their top filmmakers, DOPs, writers, directors, actors, designers. Yes. Wow. And this is for a film that you made called Aim High in Creation. Yes, correct. Which is like a really wicked, like cheeky film. Propaganda here. And it's about you kind of – it's a film where you – if you find yourself the cheeky way to take license to go make a movie there. Yeah. Uh, to learn the art of propaganda filmmaking from Kim Jong-il and yes. his descendants and his creative descendants as well. Yeah. You've got here as well one of the most interesting artifacts ever. This is Kim Jong-il's The Cinema and Directing, his book about film and what he thinks the tenets of filmmaking are. That's right. So Kim Jong-il is the father of the current leader of North Korea. They call it the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, DPRK. Anyway, he's Kim Jong-un's dad. Mm -hmm. And Kim Jong-il, I always like to think of as a filmmaker who got the wrong job. (laughs) I mean, he he was the Dictator's sensitive... Dictator's pretty close to director. Yeah, well, exa- exactly. Exactly. And if you read this book, you realise how close mm. they really are. But, I mean, Kim Jong-il was the sensitive son mm. of Kim Il-sung, who is the person who set up North Korea, as we know it. And Kim Jong-il played violin and just loved nothing more than to watch cinema. And he had 20,000, yeah. um, you know secretly imported through diplomatic bags from around the world. Yeah. Western movies was a particular fan of Elizabeth Taylor and the James Bond franchise. Yeah. He His loved... archive might have even more films than our infinite shelves he... holds. Oh, totally. In yeah. fact, yeah, he'd take one look at this video store and say, you need to see mine, mate. <laughs> and it was a vacuum-sealed vault in Pyongyang. He mm-hmm. loved Jackie Chan. Mm. But he really did know his stuff. He was yeah. an absolute cineast. Absolute ferocious and cinephile. He had, yeah, and he had a kind of, uh, he had a, a bi- bipolar dilemma in a way, mm. a quandary, in that he then became, got the top job in North Korea, which is to be <laughs> a dictator yeah. or the leader, um, the most isolated nation on earth. 
uh, that relies on movies to propagandize its mm -hmm. people, that doesn't have access to the internet, that only has two official TV channels and has a cinema in every single suburb. Wow. Right? So God. cinema I'm convinced I'm convinced to move over. Cinema long after long after we all left, you know, cinemas and went to mm. DVD and then um, digital and streamers, cinema remained the most persuasive art form in North mm. Korea. So in this book, The Cinema and Directing, which is a a small part of a bigger book he called wrote called The Art of the Cinema, there's this fascinating kind of tension between his political goal, mm -hmm. which is to overthrow all forms of US imperialism and advance the communist dream of uh, the North Korean people and convince them they are the luckiest people on earth for living in the socialist utopia that is North Korea. And then the tension between that and his absolute obvious love of Western films yeah. and Western filmmaking. And it's all the way through this book. And so those techniques that come through that are like such part of Western filmmaking mm -hmm. of the like the use of music to kind of control emotion or to play with emotion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And in Pulgasari itself, you see those ideas of like his tenets of filmmaking, which are uh, like the, the familiar storylines of them, like where this time Pulgasari is this giant beast. Yeah. And it's all about the people coming together to overthrow, uh, I mean, quite overtly, like capitalism and all yeah, those yeah, kind of yeah, things. Yeah, and yeah. like a lot of the films that you've told me about and you've talked about in your film uh, and in your book are films that follow that pathway. Mm. But it's so interesting to see that be applied to like a really fun, like Godzilla action movie yeah. with like great special effects. The films all look beautiful because they shoot on film stock. So yes. they all look stunning. Like all of these films look so beautiful and dreamy and like just like actual pure cinema. Yeah. And I think that this film, the only thing more interesting and fascinating than the film itself is the backstory of like how this film gets made. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, North Korean cinema, uh, North Korea is isolated. And yeah. so even when I shot there and I went there twice in 2012 now, a long time ago, even back then they still hadn't gone digital. They were still shooting on old German RE cameras. Mm -hmm. They were using kind of Italian B-movie techniques for want of a better word. They did not record sound. They did post-dubbing. Mm -hmm. They loved those 70s 20 to 1 crash zooms. Yeah. Um, you know, they did a lot of special effects mm -hmm. in camera, which I love. I love that. I love that stuff. The so, electrifying stuff that like, you know, it makes you feel like that feeling of when you're making films with your friends when you're young. Yeah. Like in camera But effects. because they're Korean mm -hmm. and the Korean are the only people the Japanese really fear, they don't hold back. Like Kim Jong-il's war movies, the special effects done in camera mm -hmm. did involve actors on rafts in the ocean with torpedoes exploding around them yeah. in concentric circles. I mean, one of the films I shot when I was there that they were making was a military propaganda film being shot on the mm -hmm. decks of an American spy ship that the North Koreans had captured in 1968 called the Pueblo. Yeah. And there I was in 2012 and they were filming the capture and everything was being done in camera again. Yeah. They were waving smoke with handkerchiefs and all of this. Those but, scenes in your film are yeah. so wild because as well you've got these Caucasian actors mm. that are playing uh, yeah. like the enemy, the US in the film. Yeah. But they are North Korean citizens. Born and bred. Born and bred there. Their father was a defector who yeah. became like the great villain they of the They hated me on films. sight, yeah. And then you're listening to them talk and it's like, wow, they have no... No idea. No, like it's their accent is Korean. They it's are like, Korean. Yeah. Yes, it's absolutely. So, it's so wild. Yeah, the Dresnoks. Yeah. And there's a wonderful documentary... Um, made by Nick Bonner, who's one of the people who helped me get into North mm -hmm. Korea, who's a, a filmmaker, producer, a propaganda poster collector based in Beijing, wonderful man, and it's called Crossing the Line. Mm -hmm. So that's a great film about the Dresnoks. And, and yes, I ended up playing the wife of one yeah. of these sons who was a blonde, blue-eyed, six-foot-four. And six the foot chemistry four. was powerful. Oh, yeah, <laughs> I couldn't get enough of him and likewise. But, I mean, the point about North Korean films mm -hmm. is – I'm fascinated by propaganda. Yeah. I'm fascinated by how cinema is such a powerful art form that 
not just dictators, but also Western democracies mm. often find reasons to censor it yes. because it's so powerful, right? So what makes it powerful, okay? And so what I was trying to work out with North Korea, which, you know, basically it's number one. Kim Il-sung said film is the most powerful weapon, which is echoing Lenin. Mm -hmm. And the Russians, as we know, have a very strong tradition of persuasive filmmaking and some brilliant filmmakers. So what were the techniques they were using? And as And the first... When I was doing it, now you can get North Korean films online. Yeah. And there's a great website weirdly called North Korean Books. You go there, they've got all all the great North yeah. Korean classics. But back then, the only film I could find, apart from some hokey music videos about Kim Jong-il on a white stallion being born on a mountain, was Pulgasari, which weirdly someone had uploaded and no one had taken it mm -hmm. down. And I was like you, immediately hooked because while North Korean narratives are pretty narrow, it's always about the dialectic, you know, the people united will never be defeated. So you've got to have an evil imperialist mm -hmm. or capitalist enemy. And then you've got to have a noble but working class, humble peasant type or a farmer who rises up and everyone rises up and follows communism and sails happily into the socialist utopia. So the storylines are pretty limited <laughs> because it's propaganda after all, right? And, and the rules, according to Kim Jong-il, on how to do that are also fairly formulaic. Mm. Like every great propaganda film must have a song. You know, it doesn't matter what the genre mm. is, whatever. Um, you must use vernacular the people understand. The people have to find the song easy to sing. Uh, the heroes have to be humble and noble and the enemies have to be really, like, not Richard. nice. Yeah. So, so it's kind of counterintuitive. He's not into... Um, the actor playing the bad guy has to find redeeming features. No, the actor playing the bad guy, he literally says the actor should hate that person with his heart and soul and want to destroy him. <laughs> yeah. So can you imagine what it's like being a villain? But what I didn't know and what most people don't know about North Korean films is genre, anything goes. Mm. So would you believe it? North Korea has produced rom-coms, noir thrillers, monster movies, buddy films, um, <laughs> up Woody Allen kind of marriage, kind <laughs> wow. of divorce, yeah. uh, obdocky stuff. Wow. I mean, they really go to town on the genres. Yeah. And, which brings us to Pulgasari, one day Kim Jong-il goes, I think we need a North Korean Godzilla. Mm -hmm. And he has, I think we've got to drop his name in now, mm -hmm. Shin San Ok. Shin San Ok was a very famous South Korean director who was allegedly kidnapped by Kim Jong Il, who was basically trying to play the Dr. Evil of the International Film Festival circuit. Uh, kidnapped him in, I think, allegedly the late 80, uh, late 70s, mm -hmm. and ushered in the golden period of North Korean film, where, for a very short time, North Korean films were actually wowing people on the world stage. They were picking up awards at Carla Viveri in Paris, mm. et cetera. And a lot of this is thanks to Shin san -ok, the South Korean director who directed Pulgasari, and not only him, his wife, ex-wife, Choi Yun-hee. A leading actress. Leading actor from South Korea, who was also allegedly kidnapped, hadn't seen Shin for a long time since they'd divorced, suddenly was required to play happy couples with Shin again wow. in North Korea, and not only that, make films together. Choi Yun-hee didn't just act in the first North Korean film with sex in it, which all the defectors mm -hmm. I interviewed remembered, called Salt, yeah. which had all the sex in it, which is taboo now, like yeah. they don't put sex in films. But she also directed some films herself. And between them, they made, produced, or directed, or wrote, or starred in 13 films in the, I think, seven years that they yeah. were in North Korea. The, the censorship cuts both ways. The people I interviewed in South Korea, including Choi Yun hees agent in Seoul, they're not allowed to watch South North Korean films. Wow. Right? So it's like the dialogue is not quite there, which is why it is so amazing that Paul Gasari... It's just on YouTube. How did that happen? Yeah. It's just on YouTube for anyone to watch. The backstory to that is... Kim Jong-il says to one day to Shin san -ok, who's living in his gilded cage, mm -hmm. no doubt in the nicest hotel in Pyongyang, and there, there are some, he says, you're going to make a monster movie next. Shin san -ok starts making his attempt at a monster movie, turns around to Kim Jong-il, says, your animators are shit. They're not up to it. Mm -hmm. I don't believe these monsters they're giving me. It doesn't work. The special effects, it's not good enough. 
Kim Jong-il, money no object, North Korea had a lot of money back then, said okay and flew the entire production crew from Toho Studios yep. who'd made the Japanese Godzillas, including, I, get, I love this, including their main rubber suit monster mm-hmm. wearer guys, Ken, Ken Pachuryo Satsuma, to come to North Korea to do Pulgasari. Yeah. And all for Shin San Ok. I mean, if Shin San Ok had said, he, he did literally say on one film, I need to blow up this train track. Kim Jong Il said, "Sure, here's a train too. Wow. Let's blow it all up, a all in camera." Arts. Yeah, page- right. Wow. Exactly. I yeah. mean, if you were in with Kim Jong Il, it's kind of like Lenny Riefenstahl with Hitler. I yeah. mean, he he gave his filmmakers gold Rolexes, good apartments, blah blah blah. Gosh. Sent them to Russia to train. All that's gone now, yeah. but but that they all talk to me about that as the golden era. Yeah, that's so fascinating. I don't know how that's not a movie. Like how someone just gone, we've got to make the story of the make of Pulgasari. Well, hey, hey, why don't you do it? Maybe that's our collaboration. Let's pop it into the AI generator <laughs> and pop another movie out before the end of the I episode. I actually spent 48 hours walking around the outer suburbs of Tokyo mm. looking for Kenpachiro Satsuma because yeah. I wanted to interview him about yeah. what was it like wearing the monster suit in Pyongyang. I couldn't find him. Yeah, gosh. Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah. Well, that's Pulgasari. I believe it has our highest recommendation. Yeah? Yeah. I, think, I really like it. Do you like too. the little monster? I love the little she's monster. She's feeding it and then it grows and grows. It's so fun because I love Godzilla movies. I grew up with them. Yeah. And seeing just a new interesting take on it with also all this like political propaganda yeah. interspersed throughout, what a great way to freshen up a movie. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, it's a bit heavy-handed. I mean, the ending is so on the nose. Absolutely. You on know. that snout nose of Pugasari himself. Oh, uh, yeah. But but it's still fun. It's and, fun. And some of the – I also love that just goes with this video store we're in yeah. now, the kind of the big hair bandana, mm. kind of bare chest yeah. aesthetic of the fights. Exactly. It's so enjoyable. And I think to me, that's my starting point into this, uh, for me, a completely uncharted era of cinema. Yeah. And I think it's a really nice starting point. And also if it's the only point you're going to explore, you'll have a good time too. Exactly. But remember, you can go to North Korean books and I brought along a couple of yeah, examples of more. other North Korean genres. This is a kick-ass kung fu action film wow. com- called Hong Kil Dong. Wow. Again, a lot of North Koreans are hardcore. A yeah. lot of the stunts are performed oh, in so. camera, Alexei. Yeah. In fact, I filmed their taekwondo team who is banned from performing oh. at the Olympics. And they put on a show just for us. And I have not seen such incredible acrobatics. Amazing. So that's a, a kind of... Martial arts film. Martial arts, but the, the main character's also got a sensitive side and he likes yeah. to play flute. And it's got <laughs> lots of great ninja stuff. Yeah, okay. And it was all shot on, on this outdoor film set Kim Jong-il built wow. to stop his film crews from defecting. Mm-hmm. So they couldn't go and shoot anywhere else. So they just shot there and I've filmed there too. This is... <laughs> This is like, I don't know. This is called Schoolgirl's Diary. Schoolgirl's Diary. And it's a little coming-of-age story about a a young 16-year-old who feels estranged from her father and is angry with her father because he never spends time with her. And it's only at the end of the movie that she finds out that he hasn't spent time with her because he's been working for the dear leader to advance North Korea and invent new things. So a happy ending. Happy ending because she realises her father's a hero, so it doesn't matter that he was a crap father Mm -hmm. because he's helped North Korea. This was written allegedly by Kim Jong-il and executive produced and one of the last North Korean films to be seen officially in any Western film wow. festival context in 2006 in France. Oh my gosh. Um, and and then, then this other one, this, this is the one is I know psychedelic. most from the film, the This is girl. psychedelic. If yeah. you want to see the beauty of cinema wow. on celluloid, this is a melodrama. This mm. is a period melodrama, kind of as big and out there and weird and unbelievable as Poor Things. Yeah. And it's about a little match girl who has to work to... Save her. One of the great archetypes of Little Match Girl, by the way. (laughs) (laughs) One of the great character archetypes. I mean, it's just full of symbolism where really you'd have to be run over by a truck not to see it. Um, But uh, it's it's got a very weird aesthetic that's Mm. almost... Come oh back gosh. in vogue now. So I can't wait to dive check in. Check it out. Yeah, these are now part of the collection here at the video store. I'm going to be diving in. Yeah. We've got one more weekly from you yes. here. I yeah. suggest we jump into this film. Okay, cool. This is a film I'm very excited to talk to you about, The Five Obstructions. Yes. Yes. 
documentary. From our documentary film section here. Yes. From director Lars von Trier and his mentor Jorgen Leth. Yes. This is a pretty iconic film. Could yeah. you give us a little rundown on what The Five Obstructions is? Well, um, Jorgen Leth made a film in the 60s called The Perfect Man. Mm-hmm. And it was seen as close to a perfect film. And Lars von Trier being um, a kind of uh, a filmmaker who thrives on on friction, yeah. um, thought he would take his mentor to task on this mm-hmm. and say, is it really perfect and can you make it better? And are you really a perfect filmmaker? So Lars von Trier was a, a tough person to mentor mm-hmm. and he then sets Jorgen – uh, Leth on is it five? It's yeah, five. Five obstructions. Five obstructions, and you can take over there, Alexei, because yes. I haven't seen this film for a long time. I just remember it being crucial to yeah, me. Yeah, I rewatched it recently because I had seen it back in my video store days when yeah. I was trying to explore around. I'm not like a big Lars von Trier head or anything. Like I appreciate his work and I appreciate who he is in film and cinema and why he is important and an essential voice. But this was always the one that made me the most curious because yeah. it is kind of – it's uh, like – it's in that dogma kind of movement from him yeah. where it is all about like kind of creating that reality. But he sets out Jorgen Leff onto these five obstructions. I can even tell what you what are those they? five Bring it up on your are. very high-tech screen there. Absolutely. Let me log deeper into the film right now. So he challenges him to go out and remake his film in – Five different ways. That's right. The what first one again? being um, he must remake the film in Cuba with no set, with no shot lasting longer than 12 frames, which is half a second because uh, there are 24 frames per second. And he must answer the question posed in the original film. And in this task, Leth is successful. Right. The second task is he must remake the film in the worst place in the world but not show that place on screen. Yep. Additionally, Leth must play himself uh, the role of the man, the leading character. Yes. The meal must be included because the film involves yeah, yeah. eating a meal. Yep. But the woman, the other character film, is to is not to be included. And then he remakes his film in the red light district in Mumbai, but he he's in front of a translucent screen so he can still see yeah. the world behind him. And according to Von Trier, that's a failure. Yeah, yeah. So he gives him a completely different challenge for his third one okay. as punishment. And what was that? It is because he failed, Von Trier punishes him, <laughs> telling to either remake the film in any way he chooses, the freedom of choice, yeah. which can be one of the biggest obstacles in the world, yes. or else repeat it again with the second obstruction in Mumbai. Oh. To just do it exactly the same so he does So he does a different one, I He does hope. a different one. He goes to Brussels and he uses split screen technology. That's Right. to film it then the fourth does he one, succeed at that one he gives him the success he says okay, he cool, succeeds cool. the fourth one cool. and, is, and by the way they do that but while drinking lots of vodka or yeah, something don't it's they it's all that fun stuff of them together yeah, not yeah, unlike yeah. you and i right yeah, now yeah, sitting yeah. across from each other mentor and but apprentice. with alcohol yes we've got just plain water here yeah, right yeah. now we'll admit to it yeah then he goes to make it as a cartoon yeah it's the next obstruction That's and he goes right. to rotoscoping technology yeah which i guess is considered animation mm. is what their their conclusion is yeah and then the fifth of do you remember what that is? No. It is <laughs> Lars von Trier himself has already remade the film. Yeah. Uh, with like as he's completely remade it, and he wants left to take ownership of his version. <laughs> and does he? The, and he? I think. Yeah. I think oh, that's he does. hilarious. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. It's thank a very you. fun one. I mean, I thank you for reminding me. I've got this thing where I very rarely watch a film twice mm-hmm. because I have a kind of telegenic vault yeah. <laughs> that. The great films, yeah. I just remember certain scenes, okay? Yes. Now, I'm not saying this is the way to go. Please, I no, think no, it's no, better to rewatch. I'm a chronic rewatcher. I think that's great, yeah. and I have failed you on this. Um, <laughs> I very rarely watch anything twice, but I know that the film's great for me if I can see an entire scene and hear it, and the mm. one I can see from this film, and it's always stayed with me, is the second one in Mumbai. Yeah. So one thing I'm really into and what, I guess why I make documentary is I'm political but I'm a hedonist. Mm. So if I wasn't a hedonist, I'd be an activist on the yep. front line somewhere, you know, Doctors Without Borders, whatever. But because I'm a hedonist, because I like to have fun, yeah. um, I do it in this kind of half-assed way, which is I try to be political with my films but at the same time having f- have fun making them. Mm-hmm. To me, I also feel like unlike Kim Jong-il's filmmakers – 
and they have no choice. I don't think audiences respond well to ham-fisted. Yeah. We know this, right? You, do, you don't want to be hit over yeah. the head. You want to be entertained and politicized by stealth. Mm, absolutely. So, to the me, the best way to send the message is in a beautiful genre s- packaging of some kind. You it know? seduce them mm. with the beauty, the joy, the humor, the power of yeah. cinema. Um, and to me, that second film in the five obstructions through the translucent screen, I totally disagree with Von Trier. Yeah. That film has stayed with me forever because. It was a profound way of yeah. talking about third world poverty, first world problems yeah. without ever saying anything. And yet the fact they're translucent, you bring your imagination to work and you can practically see and smell, we're mm. talking about smell of vision the, <laughs> s- the slum. Absolutely. And I think the reason that's so personal to me is, one, it made me realise long before American Splendour that, hey, just because it's documentary doesn't mean you can't mm-hmm. absolutely play with the form and you, yeah. you, you can use fiction techniques and it's more authentic. But it's also very personal to me because I grew up in the third world in Asia. Yeah. I grew up in Burma, the Philippines, uh, Iran, yeah. which is not technically Asia, I guess, the Middle East. Yeah. But I grew up watching very underprivileged kids um, yeah. and being very aware of my privilege. And so to see that film, to see that message, to see – I just really felt it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and also I like it. I liked I liked the dynamic. I guess there's a Norma – Anna yeah. thing going on, mm-hmm. maybe that somehow transcended a few generations. Yeah. I don't know. But but that's fun too, isn't it? Absolutely. And I think there's that it's such a unique off kilter humor or charm that this film has. Yeah. Like it's just it it's it, it doesn't exist anywhere else. Like the yeah. charm of this movie in like the way that they challenge each other. It's just a very specifically it's hard to say it, but it's a specifically good time that this film offers you. Yeah. And I think it's what makes it worth revisiting. My only thing on this revisit to it that I wish it gave me more of yeah. was just a little bit more into the insight into the actual making of the films, like the, each of the films around the obstructions. Oh, yeah, 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 like yeah. just the filmmaking technique or the thing that goes into them. You see them setting up everything and you see them like – but I just was like, oh, I want to go almost a little bit deeper into the process of yeah. those. But – I think this movie is so great. But, you know, isn't that interesting, Alexei? It's it's easy to forget this, but Mm. when was that made? 2002? Yeah, 2002, 2003, I think, was released. Okay, okay. So what's really interesting is, you know, I was talking before about when I made Forbidden Lies in Mm. 2007. Yeah. No one was exposing the the apparatus of the making of the film. That Mm -hmm. was seen as very radical, right? It was a breaking of the fourth wall that people weren't doing. Mm. And so in 2002... It really wasn't done. Yeah. It was not done, partly because audiences were not filmmakers back then the way they are now. now so they is. they found it indulgent or inaccessible or it yeah. went over their heads. But now everyone's fascinated by not just the film, but yeah. how did you do it? Like with all the YouTube making of and all of that. 2002, that would have been almost a step too far, yeah. I think. Staff pick. We've got one more pick for you. Oh, great. And this is my gift upon you. Okay. This is the pressure's now upon me to present to you a film, my <laughs> staff pick recommendation okay. for you. Uh, so I've been thinking about, like, what could I possibly recommend you? And so I was thinking about all the things I know you love. I know that you love hoaxes. I know that you love media satire. Uh, I know that you love oddities. And maybe above all else, you love a bloody good prank. I'd say is something that you really like. Yes. Uh, And I know, like, these are from discussions we've had recently. And there's a pick that I think I even have told you about, but I'm like, I just need you to see this movie. Okay. And this is my best way to get you to see it. Okay. It is a film called (gasps) Ghost Watch. Horror. Oh, my God. And I've got a beautiful deluxe edition here for you may right I now. May I have a look? You may have a look. Wow. So let me tell you a little bit about Ghost Watch. For Halloween in 1992, the BBC decides to broadcast an investigation <laughs> into the supernatural. Right. This is a live TV event hosted by the Chacho legend, Michael Parkinson. Yes, there he is on the cover. And Parky is 
incredible in this movie. Right. It's like a genuinely amazing performance from him, realer than real. Yeah. And a ca- he and a camera crew attempt to discover the truth behind the most haunted house in Britain. This is basically looks, if you're watching this on TV in 1992, you would think you're watching live television. Yeah. You're not thinking you're watching a horror film. You're thinking you're watching live TV with Michael Parkinson, a trusted face on TV, literally crossing over like live crosses to a house with cameras in there okay. of a family. Uh, not unlike, you know, a lot of like the English ghost stories from like the 1960s and stuff where you're seeing like a family being terrorized yeah, by yeah, a ghost. Yeah. So it is the most intense verisimilitude that you can have because it's using that verite style, like what at that time is modern verite, which is TV direct presentation. And it is so gripping and so believable and it's so convincing in every way. But I got to say, it's that Michael Parkinson performance of like having a real presenter being in that role that I think makes it so real and so interesting. He's great. And it's also... Uh, female filmmaker Leslie Manning directed. Oh my this goodness! Film as well. well, I'm so in because I'm always looking for female filmmakers that that have yet to be properly given their due. So thank you. This is a brilliant yeah. recommendation. And in that, it's also got like the script and everything. I, as well I there love too. it. And yeah. unlike Cameron, I will return it within <laughs> um, seven years. Yeah. So you've got you've got uh-huh. a week for this one before yeah. I start hunting you down for it. Okay. But um, Anna, thank you for so much for stopping by the last video thank store with you. me. My thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Here's to fact and fiction blending <laughs> forever. Yeah, I think so. Including here. I think that's it. We're in the heart of it all. This yeah, is we the are. nucleus. We're this is the epicenter of faction. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and hopefully you enjoy this faction pick for yourself. I will, as well. I will. The last video store. <laughs>Well, that was a little moment shared between me and my hero, Anna Bronowski. Ah, my gosh. You should check out Anna's films, not just her picks. You've got Forbidden Lies. You've got Aim High in Creation. You've got her Pauline Hanson documentary, Please Explain, which is riveting. Fantastic film. is one of the great documentary filmmakers in Australia. And also her new book, That's an Angel, is available to order and pick up wherever you buy books from. Uh, let's go through her picks. You want to see poor things? Well, you might still be able to see it in cinemas, but you can also find it online to rent on VOD platforms. It might even be on Disney Plus by the time this episode is being listened to by you. Also, her picks of The Five Obstructions and Pulgasari are a little hard to find, as you might be able to imagine, but... Pulgasari is on YouTube. Like we said on the episode, someone has done the service of putting it up there and it remains intact on YouTube. The five obstructions you can find, but you'll need to look for it yourself. You might be obstructed, but you will get there. And Ghostwatch. Ghostwatch. My recommendation to Anna. Yeah, it's another difficult one to find, you know? When I've got these big film brains on, I gotta go hunting in different places to find films that they have not seen or heard of before. But Ghostwatch is so worth watching, and I might even say this, it's a great Halloween watch. It might be worth holding off, coming back to it on October 31st, watching with some friends, and just go like, I heard about this weird thing that happened on TV years ago that I, I I don't know, I just was able to track it down. And I found like this old broadcast, don't tell them it's a freaking horror movie, just tell them it's real. And you will find a lot of wealth in there. So enjoy that. My thank you to Anna for joining me on the podcast once again. If you want to check us out, we are on YouTube. You can subscribe to the YouTube channel for us and the Batuta Advocate. And you'll get to hit that bell and you'll see the episodes as soon as they come out every Thursday. The podcast also comes out on Spotify and Apple Podcasts, wherever you get your podcasts from. And catch up with me on Instagram at This Is Alexi and at Last Video Store Batuta, also on TikTok. And you can find me on Letterboxd where I put all the lists up of all the rental combos that the guests have so if you want to go through and add those films directly to your watch list on letterboxd you can actually do so until next time we meet i'm going to leave you with a little message from me i love movies